<clears throat> I'd like to welcome everyone here to the Church of Christ and those who are on Zoom. We're going to hear from uh, Dr. Robert Perez. He will lead us in a sermon, The Most Segregated Hour, No More. Isaiah 49 is where the lesson takes from. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Isaiah. While well, it's Sunday morning at 10 a.m., the most segregated hour in the United States. One more time, for those of you listening in, it is 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, still the most segregated hour in the United States. So I want you to think about that. When my wife and I moved to a new city, we searched for a congregation that would reflect the racial and ethnic makeup of the diverse community we were joining, and we found it. It was the Santa Paula Church of Christ. No, it was the American church. And the American church in the United States is making progress, because, and we are a witness to that. This morning, I just walked over next door just to get a bottle of water, and in there were brothers and sisters worshiping in another language, in our same building. That is God-given proof that we are light to the nations. Amen? Amen. And that's God's mission. So I want us to challenge us on three simple letters, three C's. The first C stands for calling. The next one stands for the challenge. And the next C stands for the change. Very simple. But that's the message I think Isaiah is asking us to, I guess, challenge us to. Okay, this morning. So... That's the problem in the text. I believe Israel being purged from Jerusalem because of what happened, being, I guess, fighting against the prophets and all the history, got exiled to Babylonia. That's the story of Isaiah. Now we're in Isaiah chapter 49, and they're still there, and they're getting a chance now to come back after the 70 years captivity. And Cyrus, the decree of Cyrus allowed them, you could read that in I think it's Ezra chapter 1. There was a, a Persian king who allowed Israel to go back. And Isaiah was witnessing that, or his prophets or his disciples were witnessing that. And he's reminding us to be a light to the nations. Why were you sent way to Babylonia? Because he reminds Israel that the nation or the mission is too small a thing for you to just restore the tribes of Jacob and Israel. No, I will make you a light to all nations. Amen? And sometimes we forget that. So, in Israel's day, there was a different kind of us versus them spirit. Us being the saved ones and those being on the outside or different ethnic groups, however you might want to look at that. It was a different kind of us versus them spirit. Israel was to be careful not to mix, and this is really important, not to mix pagan or Gentile practice with the proper worship of the Lord. You understand that? We are not, we're not living in a vacuum. We're living in a world that's pushing the envelope. And what's that balance? We are not to mix. Um, pagan, Gentile practice with the proper worship of the Lord. But that situation would also have made it difficult. Think about the challenge for us. It would have made it difficult for Israel to comprehend that the Lord wanted Gentiles other ethnic groups who think differently to come to him. And that's a lot said coming from a guy like me, right? My last name is Perez. If I go to Memphis, Tennessee, they call me Paris. Okay? <laughs> Over here, it's Perez. Okay? So think about that. The dilemma between reaching out to the lost and being a salvation to the world, and yet not becoming part of the world. That's our tension, amen? That's a dilemma that we all struggle with, and we always have to keep that balance. So that's the problem in the world. How are we going to balance that? Well, it's nothing new under the sun. We think, okay, this is our problem. This happened 2,000, maybe 700 years ago, and Isaiah is writing about it, and we're applying it to 2022. So... My point is the calling, the challenge, and the change is this, that the servant that's mentioned in this text 
And you can apply that to Jesus. You can apply that to Israel. You can apply that maybe to all the people who obey God's will. Like Cyrus, who was used as a servant of God to let Israel come back. You can apply it to all, or to apply it to your life. And I, the challenge is that God wants the servant to think globally, not parochially. And I looked up that word, parochial. It means to be closed-minded. It means to be think narrowly. It means to think provincial, provincially. That we just think about ourselves. And when we think, think about that, sorry, I have to preach here a little bit. We have to be challenged. A wicked servant. If you see the end of the book of Isaiah, there is a challenge between two types of servant. A wicked one and a righteous one. And the righteous servant disadvantages themselves for the sake of others. That sounds like Jesus to me. Amen? Think about that. A righteous servant disadvantages him or herself for the sake of others. But the wicked one on the opposite extreme, it doesn't sound so wicked, but it is, advantages themselves or himself or herself at the expense of others. You've heard that from me before. That's the challenge. And these servants are mentioned in the text throughout this text and throughout Isaiah. And Israel is caught up in the dichotomy. Are they going to be a wicked or are they going to be a righteous servant? Well, today's text challenges us that to be the righteous servant. Amen. And I know I would ask you what a raise your hands if you want to be a righteous one. Well, we all do. It's just a matter of willing to sacrifice to do that. Okay, so let's go to the text. Isaiah 49. It's a great one. And the first three verses are really the first C, the calling. Before God wants to challenge you to think globally instead of provincially or parochially, he reminds us and he gives us comfort. Okay, that's what I always want to hear first. You came to church and if you're beat up a little bit this morning, then this three verses are for you. Look what he says. It's a beautiful calling. Listen to me. Not to Bob Perez, he's saying to God. You islands, hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, I love this. Before you were born, God called you by name. He knows your name. Before I was born, the Lord called me from my mother's womb. That's important in today's day. Think outside the box and what's going on in our nation. He called us from our mother's room, so this person was born and alive inside the mother's womb. You understand what I'm saying. He made my mouth, and I thought this was interesting. He called me. That's the first thing, the calling. You think that God does not care about you? Well, right here it says that the servant, God knew you before you were even born. Before I was born, he called me from my mother's womb. He made my mouth, and why his mouth? Because remember Isaiah chapter 6? Oh, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And what does the seraphim do to him? He says, I will purge your iniquities, and he takes a coal, and he touches his lips, and then he hears the Lord. Who will I send? What does Isaiah, God say, send me? That's a great song if you look it up from Mercy Me. I don't know, that's inspiring text, isn't it? I mean, just to think about that calling and we're part of it. So before I was born, verse 1b, the Lord called me from my mother's womb. And here's what he says. He has made my mouth like a sharpened sword. What does that mean? The word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. It's the word. And he wants his prophets and, and preachers and teachers and members of the Church of Christ and Santa Paula and you sitting there to be sharp. My mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. So God takes care of you. He loves you. Amen. He loves me. And I like the second part. He made me like a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. So when Robin Hood puts on his you know, little quiver, that's where you keep the arrows and they're all polished and ready for battle. That's what he wants us to be, to be ready. Like a polished arrow, ready for battle. He concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant. I hope you heard God telling you that right now. Amen? That God's saying that, you are my servant. Even you way out in the corner over there, 
You are God's servant. Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. And when I saw that word splendor, it reminded me of a book that was written in the 1950s about the five missionaries that went to uh, South America and got martyred through gates of splendor. I don't know if you remember that, but it's a great movie, a great book. And I remember reading that when I was a young man in Africa through gate, gates of splendor. And these missionaries went there and they got martyred and their wives went back and converted the tribes. And there's a great movie you can watch. It's called End of the Spear about that, the second generation. So that's what we, our calling is. So think about your calling. He tells you to listen. He tells you to, he has called you from your mother's womb. He wants you sharp. He wants us sharpened. He wants us like polished arrows because you are my servant in whom I will display my splendor. So are you going to be his servant? I like that when you say, yeah, because I want to be a servant. That means we have to go back and purge some of our iniquities, right? And you guys know me. And I know you, so we know each other. We have to help each other, sometimes push each other to be purged of our iniquities. So look what he says. I like this. This is the challenge part where Isaiah or the writer, maybe Isaiah had passed away and his, his disciples were living 150 years later. So here's what he says. He comes to grips with his calling or with, with that calling. But I said, and I thought about this. Why? This is my version of it, okay? Why should I do all this? No one listens to me anyways. I do all this work and try and get people to come to church and no one's listening. And no one comes. And it seems like a waste of time. That's not what he said, okay? But it sounds like it. Read the verse. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. And then he comes to grips with whose work it is. You know what it reminded me? What was said when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, I planted, Apollos watered, but who gives the increase? But God gave the increase. That's what he comes to grip with here. But I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. This is verse 4 in Isaiah 49. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand and my reward is with my God that's a great verse that's the hinge verse he came to grips that he can't do it without God's help or basically God is the, is the one that does everything I planted Apollos water but God gives the increase you want this church to be a filled up church we have to pray to God and help, say God help us to be I was going to say wicked servants, <laughs> righteous servants, right? Those who disadvantage themselves for the sake of others. And that's not easy, right? That's not easy to do. We have to think through that theologically or whatever and go home and say, you know, I better make the decision to go because if I stay home, I'm going to be selfish today. I know, I'm glad I read this yesterday before I went to Riverside because I wasn't going to go. I don't want to go to Riverside. And I read the righteous servants thinks globally, not parochially. And then I said, boy, I better go. And I went. And I got blessed with new golf clubs yesterday. Sorry I had to say that. <laughs> that was in my quiver. I did not expect that, and it got me teary-eyed that my whole family bought me some new clubs. So it was a blessing. But I just want to know that God wants the blessings for you too. Amen? Amen. We don't see them. I didn't expect that. So... I have to give a little bit of scholarly exegesis here. When he says in verse 4a, yet what is due me is in, my, is in the Lord's hand, Lord's hand, and my reward is with God. In Hebrew, it's what is due me is my just reward. It's the word mishpati. Remember I mentioned that in the song of the vineyard? Mishpat means justice, and righteous means tzedakah. And remember I gave in the parable of the vineyard, he was looking for justice, but he found bloodshed. Bloodshed. He was looking for mishpat, instead he found mishpat. There's the dichotomy between the wicked and the righteous servant. He's looking for people in the church to, to proclaim justice, and when he looks around, he's just finding bloodshed and the chaos and destruction. 
And within the church, we have to be challenged, amen, at times. And so do I. So God, what is due me is my just reward, which comes through God's justice alone. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, right? Individual with liberty and justice for all. Where did that come from? It came from right here from Isaiah. Our nation was founded on justice. Now, we may not have lived up to that decree, you know, the battle that's going on in our country, but follow that. It's God who proclaims justice. Don't forget that. Amen. And we have to remind people not to be shy to proclaim God's justice. You could read Isaiah 56, 4 through 7, and I can go over it, but I just want to stick to my point. So that's the challenge, the calling, the challenge, he comes to grips with his role. He knows, or she knows, the servant here, that his mission, and he reiterates it, or his calling, before he accepts what God challenges him to do. Okay, so I know that's confusing, so let me just read this clearly. Now that the servant comes to grips with his role and his mission, he reiterates his calling and the challenges will he accept it. So let's look at verse 4b, or 5, I mean. Verse 5 says this. This is the, as he transitions into the challenge. Now the Lord says, look what he does. He's contemplating. The Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be a servant. He goes back to his calling. So you have to believe that you are called by God in order to change. Amen? Amen. And if God did truly form you in your mother's room and you believe that, then God wants us to act upon that. And that's what he's doing here. And he's going to push the servants in Babylon. He's going to push them to the challenge. Now the Lord says, verse five again, he who formed me in my mother's in the womb to be his servant, and notice what he says. Remember I talked about, he challenges us to think <coughs> globally instead of parochially. He falls back to his maybe parochial vision until God speaks. That's what the hinge of this text is about. Who formed me in the womb to be a servant. And notice what he says, to bring back Jacob, or bring Jacob back. Well, who's Jacob? Well, that's the father of Israel. You read the Old Testament, Jacob's name's turned to Israel, and he's talking about Israel being exiled. That's part of his role, to bring him back from Babylon to Jerusalem. To be a servant, to bring back Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. So he talks about the whole nation. That was his mission. For I am honored in my, for I am honored in my eyes of, I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. And then now God speaks. When you read the text, God finally speaks here. And it's that verse in our bulletin. And look what he says. It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. It's too small of a mission. What's our mission in the church? Not to think just about ourselves parochially and a challenge to be the wicked servant, to advantage ourselves at the expense of others. He challenges us to be the righteous servant to disadvantage of ourselves at the, for the sake of others. That's what he's saying here. It is, I will make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. And there's no farther ends of the earth than Santa Paula, California from Babylon. I was thinking about that geographically. We're about as far away from where this original text was written as you can possibly be, be other than the people in Hawaii. So we are at the ends of the earth. Thank God for this text, amen? Because amen. we are part of that mission. And the reason why I picked that text, I had to pick this text, there's four servant songs 
but I picked three of the four. And this one, the reason why I picked this one, because it's written in, about in the New Testament. Did you know that? This last line, 49.6, is written on Paul's first missionary journey 500 years after Isaiah wrote this. And on his first missionary journey, he goes into Pisidian Antioch and he's giving a sermon in the synagogue and the Jews are jealous and they kick him out. And they're mad at him. And they're still denying the Messiah. So Paul, in chapter 13 of the book of Acts, says this, when Barnabas, this is verse 46, and 47 is the quote, then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. I thought this was great. You want to be bold? Stay hungry in the word. Be sharpened. Answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. But since you rejected and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. And he quotes that verse from Isaiah 49.6. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And look what the Gentile, the Gentiles respond. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored. I'm glad and honored that someone spoke the word to me. Amen? Amen. Aren't you? That someone went out of the way to do this. He says they were glad and honored the word of, of the word of the Lord and all who were appointed and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. Interesting text. That's another sermon. So, is 10 a.m. Sunday morning, no, I'm going to reverse it. 10 a.m. Sunday morning is no longer the most segregated hour of the week in the Santa Paula Church of Christ. Do you realize what we did in this church? We're doing what most people cannot do. Amen? We're honoring the sacred task of the Gentile mission and thinking bigger than just ourselves. Amen? And that's hard. To do we know there's problems that come with it from both groups us we are part of the problem and goes back and forth but guess what we are doing what God said to do so it's 10 a.m. Sunday morning no longer 10 a.m. Sunday morning is no longer the most segregated hour of the week uniting them under the or our groups under the banner of the good news of Jesus Christ began in Isaiah's gospel Isaiah's gospel, he started talking about reaching out to the nations when they were in exile, and they had to be humbled. Israel had to do their part. The Messiah, our Lord and Savior, did his part. How about you? Will you do your part, or will you and I do our part? Amen? What specifically do you need to do, or do you need to start doing in order to honor this honor task. How, be, how about becoming or challenge our, challenge ourself, challenging ourselves to be the righteous servant rather than the wicked servant? We need more servants who will disadvantage themselves for the sake of others in the kingdom of God. Amen? May God bless this honor task. And, uh, if you want to do that and give yourselves in the humble act of believer's baptism, there's nothing more humbling and righteous than that first humble act to become a believer in Jesus Christ. May God bless you as we stand and sing the song of invitation. 589. 589.